like to welcome you to our Tuesday Bible study. We thank you for joining us tonight, and we hope something said tonight. You can find a place to associate with your living here on this earth. We're going to now begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne, we first humble ourselves. We put our flesh into subjection. No matter what we're going through, no matter what is going on around us, this is a time that we put it aside and focus on you. We praise you, we honor you, we give you glory. Father, we just love you and everything about you. We know that we are your beloved people and that we were created by you as well as this entire earth. And you are always in control. So Father, we just celebrate coming together as one to learn more about you, to draw closer in relationship with you so that we can reflect the way of your son Jesus, our Savior. So Father, I ask that your spirit clear all hearts, minds, souls to hear a word from you. And I ask that illumination is brought forward in how to apply what we hear to our own individual lives. Father God, I ask that you bless the Rivers of Life ministry and every single aspect of it. Father, let us always follow the path that you illuminate for our church and for our beloved people that is a part of the church. We thank you for every part of your plan in kingdom work. We ask all these blessings and your blessings in Jesus' name, and we pray, amen. I'm going to sing this song. It's a favorite of mine. And if you know it, and I know you do, please join me. Glory, glory. Oh. 
invitation, and for those of you that are in the sanctuary, that you stand, please stand. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 100 if you're watching. And if you're watching via Facebook Live, you can stand with us as well and turn your Bibles to Psalm 100. And when you have it in the sanctuary, you can say amen. John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8, we're going to read verses 1 through 11. And I'm going to be reading from the King James Version tonight. It simply says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman, taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself, said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. 
And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one beginning at the eldest even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Can we all say amen? Tonight I want to talk, teach a lesson from the subject caught and guilty, but forgiven. Caught and guilty, but forgiven. I want you to get that in your spirit. Caught and guilty. There's no question in that. Caught and guilty, but forgiven. I want to begin our lesson tonight by simply saying that there are two kinds of sin. And when I say there's two kinds of sin, I'm not talking about big sin and little sin. But there are two kinds of sin, meaning the sins we commit openly and those that are done in secret. Open sins, if you will, are brazen sins. Very brassy. Uh, most times they are done without thought or remorse. Uh, most times you see sinners openly sinning. Um, sinners take the world by storm. Sinners move without care and without caution. Uh, they do not try to hide their sins. They don't try to close or keep close their sin. They do what sinners do. They just Sin. Live unrighteously. Don't live with a, 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 a care or caution or maybe I should say a fear or reverence for God. They're just sinners. Say amen. And we have to be very careful um, when dealing with sinners. Because 90% of the Bible was not written to sinners. It was written to believers. When God inspired the Apostle Paul to write uh, three-fourths of the New Testament, he was writing to churches that believed. Believers. Christians. This was after the Antioch experience. After, after Antioch, where the people were first called Christians, Paul begins to then write to churches. When he writes to the church at Galatia, he says, Oh foolish Galatia, who hath bewitched you? In other words, I, I, I preach the gospel, I've taught the gospel to you. Now you allow somebody to come and disrupt or try to challenge or try to change or alter what you believe. So much of the Bible is written to believers, and so we cannot beat people over the head with the Bible. Because unless they are born again believers, the Bible is not applicable to them. Because the Bible is written to those of us who believe. It's almost like you can't clean the fish until you catch it. Amen. Amen. You, you, you can have all the tools you want, but if you go out to the pier and don't catch nothing, you can't clean nothing, you don't catch. 
so the same thing applies in the house of God. We have to get people to accept Jesus, then give them the word of God to clean them up. This is what this is what Paul meant. He says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and even gave himself for the church that he might cleanse it by the washing of the word. The more you get in God's word, the more you study God's word, the more the more you you you, you delve into and you commune and fellowship in God's word, the more God can make you like Him. Amen, amen. And so 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 sinners they move without care, move without caution. They sin open. But then there are those sins that are committed in secret. A lot of people sin in secret because they don't want the world to know they're sinning. Christians choose to sin in private. Now you got some Christians that are just brazen and brassy and just don't care. You know, they, they, they're not dealing, they're not allowing God to, to, to work on them. They're, they're not growing in grace. They're, they're just sinning. But, 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 but the great majority of us, if we have issues, we try our very best to deal with them between me and the Lord. Now, it's not until the Lord has told you about 20 times to let something go, or 100 times, or 2,000 times, and then he has to bring your sin openly. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so Christians sometimes choose to sin in private because they try to protect their reputation. Try to keep others from looking down on them or discrediting their ministry. Amen. However, I need you to understand tonight that you cannot hide anything from God. You, 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 you cannot hide anything from God. Scripture teaches us this in Psalms 90, verses 3 through 8. And I want to go there tonight. Psalms 90, verses 3 through Psalm 90, verses 3 through 8 says, Thou turnest man to destruction, and sayest, Return ye children of men. See, see, sometimes God allows us to go through stuff to get our attention. He, the, the, the text says, Thou turnest man to destruction, and, and, and then what does he say? Return to me. You know, some of the stuff that's going on in our lives is not a derivative of what the devil is doing. It's God's way of getting us to Turn back to him. Amen. Verse 4 it says, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Thou carries them away as with a flood, and they are as a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourishes, verse 6, and groweth up, and in the evening is cut down and withered. For we are consumed by thy anger and by thy wrath. We are troubled. Verse 8, listen to this. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins, in the light of thy countenance. Did, did, did y'all see what that says? He said, Thou hast set our iniquities before thee. God says, I know what you're doing. He said, It's before me, it's right before my eyes. I, I know what you're doing, he said, and even those things that you think are secret, he said, is in the light of my countenance. You cannot hide anything from God. And I imagine this woman in our text tonight was having a good time, enjoying her moment. And she thought she was 
in hiding, in secret. But God says that even those things that are you think are in secret, oh, talk, Pastor. He said those things are in the light of my countenance. I know nothing escapes me. Nothing passes by me. Nothing, you can't get around me. Amen. Look, um, Lee Williams said you can run, but you can't hide. Amen? Amen. Because nothing gets beyond you. My friends, I want you to understand tonight that no sin will escape the judgment of God. Am I talking? No sin will escape the judgment of God. Go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12 and, and, and verse number 36. Go to verse 33. We will read it all. Of chapter number 12 of the book of Matthew. It says, Either make the tree good and his fruit good or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. Do y'all see that? You ain't got to wear no shirt that says you're a Christian. You ain't got to wear a hat that says I love Jesus. You ain't got to go around being a holy rope. The Bible says you're going to be known by your fruit. By the fruit that you bear. By, by your actions. By your character. By your demeanor. How you treat people. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. He says, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? He said, ain't going to happen. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaking. No, you ain't have no slip up. You said what you meant. You meant what you said. And the young people got to do things. I said what I said. Somebody say amen. Amen. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringing forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of the heart bringing forth evil things. Verse 36. But I, I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Nothing escapes God. You might get away with it right now and, and, and make people feel, you know, a little uneasy right now and you think you got away because you gave them two pieces of your mind or two cents or whatever that, that saying is. But, 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 but God says that, that, that on the day of judgment, every idle word, everything that you say, everything that you do, you have to give account for it on the day of judgment. Come on, say, somebody say amen. amen. Jesus came the first time to bring salvation into the world. But the second time he's coming to bring judgment Somebody say amen. amen. He's coming to bring judgment into the world. And so one of the things that I have nothing escapes him. But I need you to also understand is that a lot of times when you see in the Bible the word conversation, or when Jesus or when those persons of that day are talking about conversation, they're really talking about lifestyle. So when he says, every idle word that thou speakest, thou shalt give uh, account for on the day of judgment, what he's talking about, your lifestyle will be in question. Your lifestyle will have to stand the test of time. Your lifestyle is going to come before the judgment seat of Christ. And, and how you lived, am I talking here? And how, how, how you behaved down here. Amen. That song is true. This is the dress it up room. Amen. You, you can't go to heaven for what you're going to do in heaven. You got to go to heaven for right down here. How you lived here. And I tell people at funerals especially, you can't live wrong and die right. I don't care how much they preach and how much they sing and how much they shout at your funeral. Amen. Amen. You got to go to heaven from right down here. Amen. And so this woman, although her sins were in, she thought her sins were in secret, 
they were not in secret. That God saw all things. And not only did God see those things, but people saw those things. Uh, my friends, we must know that whether openly or done in private, sin is sin. And the repercussions and consequences of sin do not change. The same reprimand stand for those that are done openly and those that are done in secret. Amen? Go to Romans uh, chapter 6. Is this good teaching? And this teaching is not to make you feel bad by all means. This teaching is to show us where we are with God and to get us in alignment with where God wants us to be. Amen? Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, 15 through 23. How do you can say amen? It says, what then shall we, it says, what then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Grace opens us up to salvation. It is the open door for us to be saved. It is unmerited favor. We do not deserve salvation. So grace opens the door for us to be saved. But unfortunately, we live in a day now where, 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 where people um, think that grace is a free ticket to sin. Because of grace, we just do what we want to do. Because God for, forgives or God, you know, knows the heart. You know, you know, we hear that all the time. God knows my heart, right? And But, but the Bible says, should we sin that grace may abound, God forbid, how can we let a dead to sin? live therein, you know, when, when, when you when you uh, come to know Jesus Christ and you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, then you are dead to sin. In other words, you don't dwell or live or abide in sin. It doesn't say that you won't sin, but you shouldn't be living in sin. You shouldn't be making conscious efforts every day, every day to live in sin. Every day you wake up, you ought to, you ought to have a mind and a heart to serve the living God. And, 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 that, and this may be me going on a tangent, but this is why shacking is wrong. Yeah. Because it is a constant, everyday decision to live in a situation that does not bring God glory. Amen. It's not so much about the, the, the living, but that you can be there, amen, and not be even touching each other, but you're not married. And you're not family. You're in a relationship and you're living together, and, and, and that's just not how God wants that relationship to be. Amen? Amen? Amen. There's nothing wrong with dating, by all means. I'm, I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with dating. It's just that when dating becomes ungodly is where we get out of alignment. And I think I think the, 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 the older church told us that dating, going out, having a good time was wrong. The new church tells us that you can live together and not be touching each other, and, and, and that's right. But I think the old church had it wrong, and I think the new church has become too progressive. There's nothing wrong with dating and going out and having a good time and enjoying each other's company. There's nothing wrong with that. But there also is something wrong with living together. And, 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 and so I think, I, think, I think there's a happy medium that God wants us. I, you know, I don't believe God wants you to marry somebody that you met yesterday because you don't know them. You know, um, even in, even in biblical days, before they could get married, they had to go and live. They had to go and, and, and this is why the Bible says, for, "For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife." And that marriage to them was about consummation. It, it, it was about the act of intimacy. That's that, that's what sealed the deal for them. Amen. But 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 they were in the process of learning, learning each other. Am, am, am I talking good? Am I in the book? Am I, am, amen. And so he says, he says, What then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Verse 16. 
Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to obedient unto righteousness. And in other words, he says, if you sin, you yield yourself to sin. Nobody forces you to sin. The devil can't even make you sin. When you sin, it's because you yielded yourself unto that. Jesus said, any man that sins is a slave to sin. He's a servant to sin. Amen? This is how much sin controls us. The Bible says, let us lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us. Am I talking in the book tonight, y'all? Amen. Sin, sin becomes your Lord and you become the servant thereof. Amen. It says, but God be thanked that you are the servants of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Be then made free from sin. Listen, you don't get free from sin because someone lays their hand on you. You know, a lot of people say that deliverance from sin is when you come up and they have a deliverance service and people are spitting up in the trash cans and stuff. No, that, that's not deliverance from sin. Deliverance from sin is the moment you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because the Bible says, if the Son shall therefore make you free, you are what? Free indeed. And so, so me laying my hands on you is not greater than the Son making you free. Come on, somebody. You being free is you accepting Jesus Christ accepted what he did on Calvary's cross and that's what makes you free. Can I, can I drop a bomb on the church tonight? And if we don't get through all of it, I got another week. That's that's fine. But 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 what I want to tell you tonight is that can I tell you that there are so many people in church that think they're bound and they're really not? Back up past to say it again. There are so many people in church that think they're bound but they're really not because they're waiting on the next altar call. They're waiting on the next laying on of hands. They're waiting on that next, that, that next cross to be put on their head. They're waiting on somebody to pray for them, not realizing Christ set you free the day you accepted him because he has already he has already opened freedom up to you when he gave his life when he when he when he died on the cross when he shed his blood when 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 the veil was torn from the top to the bottom when the rocks began to cry and the earth began to quake the moon turned into blood when when, when all of those things happened on the cross that purchased your salvation that that made you free from sin and so this is why Paul comes back and says be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage because he understood that Christ has already set us free. What does he say in Galatians, I think it's chapter number six of our stand fast in the liberty wherewith who have made you free? Christ hath made you free. Stand there, be there, resolve yourself in his freedom. Don't allow, amen, a, a, a little mix-up or a little mishap or a little falling short of God's glory. Don't allow that, amen, to make you think that you're bound. You're not bound. You've been set free by the power of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Amen? Amen. Verse 17 of Romans chapter 6 says, But God be thanked that you were the skewed ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered to you. In other words, you heard the word of God. You came to Jesus. You accepted him. And so when you accepted him, you changed ownership. You, you, you changed lordship. You're, you're no longer servants to sin, but you are a servant of the most high God. And, and I'm talking good tonight. Verse 18 says, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Christ free can, can on, on Facebook put that in the feed right here in the church. Talk that talk back with me. Say that I've been free from sin. I've been free from sin. I've been free from sin. What does it mean, Pastor, to be free from sin? Sin and the devil no longer control me. If I fall in sin, it's because of my free will. It's not because I'm, 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 I'm subject to it. It's not because I'm, 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 I'm ruled by it. I now am a servant of righteousness. I, I, I'm a servant of the living God. He's my Lord. Am I talking good? Verse 19, it says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity in your flesh. 
For as ye have yielded your members' service to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' service to righteousness unto holiness. He said, just like you were dancing with the devil, now dance with God. Just like you gave the devil everything you got, give God everything you got. He said, just like you yielded your service to uncleanness, now yield yourself to holiness. Righteous living. Don't go to hell in the church. Is basically what he's saying. Don't, 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 don't come to church every Sunday and still don't make it in. If, if, if I'm going to go to hell, I'm going to go to hell the right way. And that might sound crazy, but, but it's true. If you're going to go to hell, go to hell the right way. Drink, smoke, get drunk, run with it, chase men, live an alternative lifestyle. If you have made up your mind to go to hell, don't go to hell through the church. Amen. Amen. Verse number 20. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. You were open to do what you wanted to do. This was, I'm not telling y'all what I said. I'll tell you what the Bible says. He said, when you were a servant of sin, you were free from righteousness. You didn't have to come to church. You could cuss folk out and they cross your own. You could do whatever you wanted to do. You were free from righteousness. Verse 21 says, what fruit had he in then what fruit had ye been in? Those things were of ye are not ashamed, but the end of those things is death. In other words, you, you, I mean, you were free to do what you wanted to do, but that doesn't change the consequence. You know, because a lot of people say, well, I ain't saved. I ain't got to do that. Well, no, you don't. But, but there is still a consequence. You know, you're free to do what you want. You're free from righteousness. But, 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 but be very clear. There's still a penalty for anybody who doesn't accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Verse 22, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end is everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through what? Jesus Christ our Lord. And so what I want you to understand today is that no matter what sin there is, there is a penalty and consequence for sin. The penalty and consequence for sin is death. Whether that be spiritual death or death in the world. Some people are dying filled with death just because they're in too much sin. Not necessarily because God commissioned them to die at that time. They just were in sin. Living wrong. And, 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 and the more people talked to them, the more they knew it was wrong, the more they got convicted by it, the more God kept telling them to come on in, the more God was taking people around them and all these things. They weren't heeding to the call of the Lord. Amen? When Christ returns the second time, he's coming to separate those who willingly sin from those who have committed to live for him. The question must be asked, Will you be called? The question must be asked, will you be called? Will you be guilty? Or will you be forgiven? Will you be caught with your work undone? Guilty of all your wrongdoing? Or will you be forgiven? You must ask yourself that today. Will I be caught? Will I be guilty? Or will I be forgiven? The woman of our text today was caught. She was guilty. But thank God by the end of the story, she was forgiven. Verse 3 of John chapter 8. Verse 3 of John chapter 8. It says, and the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, this woman was unexpectedly found in an unwelcoming situation. To much of her surprise, she was caught in an incriminating situation. She was caught in the very act of adultery. She was entangled or trapped in adultery. 
She was gone. She was gone. The people saw her. And I'm talking good. They saw her. Do you hear what I'm saying? The people saw her. I need you to get the imagery of the text. They saw her. She was called in adultery. Verse number four. Verse number four says, They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. So not only did they see her, but she was guilty. Called and guilty. This woman justly deserved this chargeable offense. She was caught and could not deny this particular fault and or error. Ooh. Deep, now, I'm not going to desecrate the holiness and sanctity of the sanctuary. But this woman was called she was doing it. The, 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 the Bible is very clear. She was in the very act. Now, a lot of people say, well, I thought adultery was cheating on me, right? Or cheating on me. Well, Jesus likened adultery to fornication and sexual immorality. Let's go there. Matthew 5. Oh, we're going to use the Bible tonight. Matthew 5, 27 through 32. It says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already. And it's not that angel woman. God wants us to look at each other, and it, it's easier said than done. But God wants us to look at each other as brothers and sisters. Not look at her as, oh, God, she's fine. You know? And then I'm just being honest with you. That's how God wants us to look. And now, and now, the fleshly part of us, remember now, just in Romans, he said, I write to you because of the infirmity of your flesh. Your flesh, even when I would do good, evil is also present. And so it's, it's much easier said to know, but this is why we have to pray constantly. That God will bridle us, that we will look at, we'll, we'll, we'll look with the right appropriate eye. Amen? Amen? Amen. And so he says, he says, if you look at a woman, you lust after her, you already committed adultery. Verse 29, and if thou right, I offend thee, pluck it out. Cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of the members should perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. In other words, get yourself together. When you find yourself falling into those slits, to those cracks, to those crannies, get yourself together. Am I talking good? Verse 30, and if thy right hand offend, offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable to thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Verse 31, it hath been said, who shall I put, his, put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. He says, when you are married, it's not my will that you be divorced. He said, but if you're divorced, let it be for this cause. Amen? Let it be for this reason, fornication, adultery. Amen? The breaking of vows. Am I talking good today? This woman was engaging in sexual immorality and was caught in her sin. She was caught. She was guilty. Now she's accused for punishment. Go back to John 8, verse 5. And I'm going to wrap this thing up. Listen to what they say. John 8, verse 5. Now Moses... In the law commanded us that thou should be stoned. But what sayest thou? We know what the law says, but what you want to do with this woman? See, the Ten Commandments.
spirits had already spoke against adultery. Exodus 20 and 14 says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. The law forbids a man or woman to commit adultery. Now, when they said, now Moses told us in the law, God gave the commandments to Moses. Moses wrote them, right? So they take Moses' word as law. Moses' word as words from God. Amen? So he says to them, the law forbids a man or woman to commit adultery. Anyone who does shall surely be put to death. And so when these people said, the law already told us what to do. This woman's supposed to be stoned to death. But what you say? Leviticus 20 and 10 had already said that they could not commit adultery. Deuteronomy 22 and 22 had already said the man that lied with the woman that was not his must be surely put to death. They must be stoned to death. Amen? But Jesus, in verse 7, they continued after him. He lived up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. If y'all got it together, no sin. No sin. No sin. No sin. No sin. Finito. Zip. If you are so good, then throw it. In other words, what he was saying to them was, I'm not disputing what Moses said. Because God told Moses that. He said, I'm not here to, to, to condemn the law. I'm here to fulfill it. He said, I'm not, I'm not here to throw it out. He said, but what I am saying to you is if you don't got no skeletons in your closet, then you are just enough to throw the stone. Go ahead. But other than they scattered like wildflowers. And the Bible says that they scattered by their own conscience. Their conscience made them leave that woman alone. She was called guilty, accused, and wanted for punishment. All of that. But she ended up forgiving. And the next time I talk, I want to talk about the forgiving portion. I want to talk about what it means to be forgiven. I don't think a lot of people really know what it means to be forgiven. When you are forgiven, you're not sin conscious. You don't allow the enemy to keep reminding you of the wrong you done. But you allow the spirit to remind you who you are. The Bible says it is the spirit that reminds us that we are the sons of God. God bless you. We pray that this word was, 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 was food to your heart and food to your soul. We pray that this word, amen, make you right where you are. I don't know about anybody else, but I thank God because I've had some instances when I was caught and guilty. But thank God that I ended up forgiven. And, and, and the next time we're together, I want to talk about what it means to be forgiven. Father, we love you for your word tonight. Your word is true. It's forever settled in heaven. It is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. We pray now in the name of Jesus, God, that you would, anybody that's caught today, anybody that's guilty, we pray, God, that you would extend your hand of forgiveness. Extend your hand of mercy to them. Just as you've forgiven us, Father, we pray, God, that you would do that for someone else. Grant them grace, mercy, atonement, and forgiveness. We know you to be able to do it. Father, you said if we would confess our faults, we'd be faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is our servant's prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd like to give, you can give here. The uh, receptacles are on the altar, or you can give by texting your gift of any amount to 910 335 8663. Again, that number is 910-335-8663. Or you can send your gift of any amount to Cash App. That is Rivers of Life with the number 2. Rivers, capital R, capital O, capital L. Rivers with an S. Rivers of Life and the number 2. And you can give, 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 give it in Jesus' name. 
always remember he that believeth on me. As the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. We love you. God bless you. And good night.